Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arthritis Talks. I'm Dr. Sean Bevan, Chief Science Officer at the Arthritis Society. Most people living with arthritis have experienced the debilitating pain and relentless fire that comes with an arthritis flare. Every day, we receive questions from people wanting to know more information on managing this challenging aspect of living with arthritis. So that's what brings us here today. And we're fortunate enough to have rheumatologist Dr. Michelle Teo share her insights and expertise with us. Before we get started, a few logistics. This webinar is best viewed on a laptop or desktop computer. If you have any technical difficulties, please email arthritistalks at arthritis.ca for assistance. If you have a question for our presenter, you can submit it through the Q&A button at the bottom middle of the screen. We will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can during the hour that we have together. You can click on the chat icon in the bottom middle of the screen to access the chat and connect with the Arthritis Society's chat moderator. If you'd like to close the chat completely, just click the red X icon out of the window. We are pleased to continue to provide captioning of our webinars to accommodate the diverse needs of our audience. And you'll see that running along the page. Many questions we received followed similar themes, so we will address those first before going into the live Q&A at the end of the session. Before we get started, I wanted to thank our event partners, Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg, Novartis, and other partners for their financial support of our Arthritis Talks series. Now, let's get started. First, a warm welcome to Dr. Michelle Teo, who is joining us today from beautiful, beautiful Penticton, British Columbia. Dr. Teo, welcome. First, let's get started to set some foundations. So could you just tell us a little bit about the broad categories of arthritis, inflammatory, osteoarthritis, and how, that, how they particularly differ? Wonderful. Thanks for having me here, Sean, and welcome to our audience from coast to coast to coast. Uh, I am a rheumatologist, adult rheumatologist, and inflammation-related arthritis is mostly what I see, but absolutely there is a lot of degenerative arthritis, which I commonly refer to as wear and tear arthritis um, uh, in our patients. Now, I know many of you have attended several of these um, webinars before, so I don't want to uh, reiterate things that you already know, but I'm going to do a brief overview of the difference between the two. Arthritis, it means there is a joint problem, but it can be because of, in this scenario, two main reasons. And for rheumatologists, as well as arthritis patients, we need to figure out which of the two it is. The most common arthritis that we see is called osteoarthritis. That is a degenerative condition, and it can involve a joint being damaged at one point in one's life, and as a damaged get, joint gets used, it becomes more and more damaged. So there is an example of how um, degenerative arthritis can occur. Many of you listening probably also have osteoarthritis involving your spine, your hips or your knees. This is thanks to the effects of gravity, unfortunately, uh, over a lifetime, making that joint space smaller and smaller and smaller. There, generally speaking, is no inflammation associated with the symptoms that one experiences with degenerative arthritis. Now, on the flip side, inflammation-related arthritis is related to an immune system problem. And what I tell my patients is that we uh, refer to the immune system as a part of the body that keeps us safe and healthy. It fights infections and it fights cancer. But in inflammation-related arthritis patients, the immune system goes too high. And as such, it attacks the joints tendons, where the tendons insert into bone, and other parts of the muscle skeletal system. This is an inflammation-driven process. And the location of these joints, 
sometimes can be the same places that people who have degenerative or osteoarthritis can have um, where they have symptoms. But a lot of the time they can also affect different or smaller joints as well. And it is through listening to your story, your rheumatologist doing a physical exam and also ordering appropriate investigations. Do, do we have an idea as to what type of arthritis we are dealing with? Thank you so much, Dr. Teo. Um, we do hear a lot about flares. So can you help our audience explain, understand what exactly are flares and importantly, what contributes to them? Right. Flares are very challenging and your rheumatologist or your family doctor or whoever is involved in your musculoskeletal care will be very interested to know, patient, are you having any flares? And it, it was only when I got invited to come do this talk specifically on flares, did I realize myself, holy smokes, I don't, I don't normally define what a flare is to my patients. So I think we can do a better job and absolutely flares can happen on both sides. So let's talk both sides of the arthritis spectrum. So let's talk about what our uh, flares are. Flare ups are an increase in your pain or your symptoms. So it could happen more frequently or more severely compared to your day-to-day -day symptoms. So perhaps your pain is normally a four out of 10. And you will have days where it goes all the way up to eight out of 10. Can last for a few days, sometimes weeks, but then the pain and the symptoms subside and it goes back to the baseline. When we talk about inflammation related arthritis, and uh, I'll give you some examples of that. For example, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, lupus can be associated with it, ankylosing spondylitis. These are examples and most certainly not exhaustive, but examples of inflammation related arthritis. People who have flares can experience red, hot, swollen joints that come out of the blue like that or sometimes they slowly um, develop over a few days, but the symptoms are much worse than they normally are on a day-to-day -day basis. With inflammation-related arthritis, sometimes there is no rhyme or reason and they just happen. Sometimes, however, and I only know this through the experience that um, uh, from seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis, Sometimes they can be triggered by other things that are happening in your life. Physical stressors absolutely can play a part. As an example, surgery or a major physical injury can cause that, or maybe right you've overused a certain area, which then starts this vicious, vicious cycle of inflammation in a certain body part. Uh, it is very, very important to remember when we talk about inflammation-related arthritis, I'm going to use the example that Sean had mentioned at the beginning of the talk, and it refers to a fire. When I see my rheumatoid arthritis patients and we, and we have a discussion and I describe to them what this overactive immune system is, I describe it as a fire has started to burn inside them. This is a fire that is driving the inflammation throughout their body. And unfortunately, in medicine, we are not yet smart enough. We haven't figured it out. We, don't, we barely understand the immune system, let alone what is gone awry with patients who have overactive immune systems. But what we do know is once that fire starts, it doesn't know how to stop burning. And that is where safe long-term medicines, which I'm sure many of you have heard, right? Sometimes anti-inflammatories can be used in the long-term, DMARTs, there's an example like methotrexate and lafunamide, biologics, advanced therapies. These are all examples of those safe long-term medicines that act as a fire extinguisher to put out your fire that's burning deep within that is driving the inflammation-related arthritis. If that fire extinguisher effect, i.e. the safe long-term medicines, is not used consistently, 
then that fire has the opportunities to start burning again. We call this medication adherence, meaning you got to take that medicine on a regular basis and disruptions absolutely happen because life is not perfect. But the more consistent one is and being able to take the medicines, assuming that they're doing the job and you're not experiencing any side effects, the less likely you are to experience a flare. When it comes to degenerative arthritis, wear and tear arthritis, that is, generally speaking, more activity driven. Now, remember, when it comes to wear and tear arthritis, that's more of a mechanical problem, the degenerative arthritis, the osteoarthritis. And it is the lack of joint uh, space or the, the, the nice cushioning right, of your joint that causes you to have pain. Now, why is that? Well, we know that there's a nice cartilage lining on the outside of the bone. But when the bones are squishing together and that poor cartilage, which doesn't have a blood supply, um, um, I'm sorry, a nerve innervation, so you don't feel all the squishing that happens. But when that cartilage wears off, now you've got exposed bone and bones, as we all know, if any of us have had injuries to our uh, any bones, it hurts. Right? And so your bone is feeling the pain. So the more that those bones are pushing on each other and rubbing against each other without the cushioning of cartilage because it is worn away, the more likely you are to experience pain. So over potentially overdoing it for what your body is prepared for can cause symptoms for uh, osteoarthritis. Thank you. So I think you've clarified part of this question about um, can people with osteoarthritis actually have flares um, in addition to people with inflammatory arthritis. Are flares more common in one type of arthritis than another? So in preparation for this talk, I was speaking to my nurses because my nurses do a lot of the patient education with uh, our patients. And I asked them, I asked them, what questions do you get a lot of the time? And they said, Michelle, it is very important that you articulate that patients are likely at risk of having both. And now that's our existing patients, most of which have inflammation related arthritis. But all of us are going to have an element of degenerative arthritis or osteoarthritis. It's just not symptomatic yet when we don't feel it, but over time it will. So when we see patients with inflammation related arthritis, we do have to do, I think, a better job in discussing what are the expectations in being um, pain free. Because patients who have increased pain, who also have rheumatoid arthritis, it may not be related to the rheumatoid arthritis. It may be related to the osteoarthritis or the, the degenerative arthritis. So that's again why it is so important that we understand from your story and what you tell us, as well as doing a physical exam or the best we can with what COVID and technology allows us to do, as well as investigations if they happen to be helpful, to tease out which of it, which of the two flares a patient may be experiencing. Now, if you have not been diagnosed with an inflammation-related arthritis, it is highly unlikely that that's going to come out of the blue if you experience a flare, more likely your degenerative arthritis or the osteoarthritis. But for those of you, and I'm sure there's many of you listening right now, who have both, right, you do sometimes need to reach out to your rheumatologist, your family physician, or whoever's involved in your MSK care to tease out which is which. Okay. We received many questions about nutrition from our audience and others. So are there certain foods that could trigger a flare? Yeah. Now that is uh, definitely a million dollar question. So uh, I am sure I can guarantee, I think almost every person who's listening has had a friend, family member, associate who has said, oh my goodness, Michelle, 
you have to try this diet. You have to eliminate this food because it has done wonders for my pain or my arthritis. I am sure of it. Now, here is the challenge when we're talking about food or things that happen at a more individual level for the patient. If you take a hundred people and you say all these hundred people that have osteoarthritis uh, and you go on a certain diet and you take another hundred people and they can eat whatever they want and are not adherent to a specific uh, diet. As rheumatologists and how we study things, we don't really see that big a difference at all, right? Hence, uh, I'd be surprised if your rheumatologist was to say, oh, absolutely, here, I, pull this out. All these papers are uh, supporting that this diet is going to cure your condition. I can most certainly empathize with the in inflammation-related arthritis patients that are listening today because you have pretty much um, uh, the control of your own body has been taken away. And so many people just want to have some element of say in their body and to be able to contribute to their overall physical and mental well-being while getting better and recovering from their inflammation-related arthritis. When a rheumatologist, though, uses what we know and we say, no, there isn't a whole lot of difference, I'd be lying to you if I was to say that. Because although in how we study, there is no difference, I have seen time and time and time again patients that tell me, Michelle, I took out gluten. Michelle, I have started taking turmeric. Michelle, I have taken out sugar and I feel so much better. I feel great. Now, does that make sense? Well, I, I think so, because uh, if there's almost 8 billion people on the planet, right? Uh, and not one of us are exactly the same. Well, I guess, except for you identical twins out there. But even then there are differences. I think uh, it would be naive for us to think that there's a one size fits all approach to an individual body. So what I tell my patients is that I say, look, I mean, yes, is there some literature or some media about nightshade diets, right? And the anti-inflammatory, removing nightshades like you know, eggplants and peppers and zucchini, because these are inflammatory, removing sugar, removing um, uh, carbs. Sure there is. And I tell patients, what's the harm in trying? If you notice that there's improvement and it doesn't cause any um, uh, severe restriction in your diet, it's not causing any harm to you, and of course it's financially sustainable, then I say, why not, right? And, but that requires you getting to know your own body and what the individual triggers are, right? And there are, I'm sure, lots of people out there that experience it. With degenerative or osteoarthritis, the same thing. Absolutely, there's the same thing. People swear that they see a difference. And again, in our approach to research, we don't see a difference. But that doesn't matter when you're talking about an individual. Thank you. So what advice do you give your patients about how to manage that situation when they're, when they're in the middle of a flare? Mm. I saw a patient today and I hadn't seen her for quite some time uh, because she was doing okay. And she kind of, you know, from her, from her own standpoint, she thought I'm managing, but she came back because she had such a tremendous flare, a tremendous flare. It lasted a week, but it scared her to death. It triggered her to think, I don't want to be incapacitated. I'm only in my early forties. Uh, I need to be able to work. I need to be functional. And that's what led her back here to see us. She got over the flare, but that wasn't what scared her the most. It was what it did here, the fear it instilled on her, right? And she realized that she didn't have coping skills to be able to get through it, right? Without having um, uh, a lot of anxiety and panic. So the first thing that I want and, and encourage patients to do, right, is to not 
get too anxious or concerned, right? I mean, definitely letting your healthcare provider, whoever that person is involved, understand that you're having a flare, that's a good first step, but it's unlikely to be causing any long-term detrimental damage to your body, no matter how bad it feels. So that is one thing I want to emphasize. Now, what you do to help you get through a flare is uh, again, going to be individual. Uh, some people find ice is, is helpful. Now, ice can be beneficial for more of an osteoarthritis type of picture when it's overdone. And in inflammation-related arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis as an example, sometimes warmth is better. But I've got patients and reverses the opposite, and who am I to say that's wrong? So again, it is very important to understand, not black and white, and to really do some um, of figuring out what your body needs when you're having a flare. Analgesics, this is important. Right. Analgesics in the short term during a flare. So the main things we're talking about right now, acetaminophen, also called Tylenol, anti-inflammatories, examples include naproxen or Aleve, ibuprofen or Advil. These are the most common over-the-counter ones. These medicines are a short-term uh, fire extinguishing effect to get you through that flare you're having. If you have inflammation-related arthritis, the best go-to medicine during that short term to get you through that hump or, um, and to get through that flare are anti-inflammatories. And that's because it is being driven by inflammation. Now, one has to also realize that not everybody can take anti-inflammatories. If your doctor is concerned about you having high blood pressure, if you've had a bleeding ulcer, and if you have any kidney problems, problems, you definitely want to have that plan put in place with your healthcare provider before the flare, flare up happens, because you want to have guidance. Is it okay to take anti-inflammatories when that flare occurs? Acetaminophen or Tylenol can also be used in inflammation-related arthritis, but it doesn't quite get to the root of the problem, right? Because as I said, this is an inflammation-driven process. So ideally, anti-inflammatories will, will be used as first uh, chosen medicine, but it, it may not be appropriate for everyone. And once again, I encourage you to ask your healthcare provider if that is an option for you for a flare. For patients with osteoarthritis, the go-to, the first go-to would be acetaminophen. Acetaminophen doesn't really do a whole lot for the actual process that is occurring in, in regards to the pain. What it does is it kind of numbs out the nerves so that you don't feel as symptomatic. Tylenol, we prefer to be the first line, but for a lot of people, Tylenol is not effective, especially if they're having a severe osteoarthritis flare. It is okay, and again, and also, a Tylenol or acetaminophen is not appropriate for certain patients, especially those that have a significant liver disease. So once again, you do want to make sure your healthcare provider gives you some type of plan. But if acetaminophen has been okayed for you to take and you are still symptomatic, you can also take anti-inflammatories as well. Those are two medicines that you can take together and anti-inflammatories can give you a greater amount of pain relief. It's very important as we talk about anti-inflammatories, if they are used in the short term, only one of them be used at a time. Please don't mix ibuprofen and naproxen. Please don't take it above what the bottle says unless you have been given that direction by your healthcare provider. Finally, and I mentioned it earlier, but we will be able to help manage your arthritis if we know you are having flare-ups, right? We're, we're, if we're in the dark and we don't see you for a year or six months and you've had three or four flare-ups, it is most likely that we would do some changes to one's medicines, uh, especially if it's inflammation-related arthritis. So it is important to inform your healthcare provider that the flare-ups are occurring so we can make changes as needed. Thank you, Dr. Teo. 
how about prevention? And, and maybe this is wishful thinking, but is there anything that can be done to prevent a flare from happening in the first place? Uh, and it, it's funny, I had this exact same question again today with a patient and I was, uh, uh, we were having the discussion, are you gonna live in a little bubble? Or are you going to try to engage in the activities in your life that make you feel better, knowing that some, uh, a flare up may occur while doing those activities? So that is very individualized, right? It, now you're balancing, right? The risk of a flare versus your quality of life. As I had alluded to in the past, for our patients with inflammation-driven arthritis, adherence to medicines, meaning taking your medications on a consistent level with you know, what was agreed between you and your rheumatologist is very, very important. All right, that is the number one way to reduce your flare-ups. What else can one do with who has inflammation-related arthritis um, to reduce the flare-ups? Well, okay, we can see this person. She's, she's sitting there, she's happy. She seems pretty healthy. She seems non-stressed. So if I could say, just don't get stressed. Okay, easy. Yeah, that, 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 that's, not a, that's not a hard thing to achieve. Well, of course it is, especially when a lot of our stress is not in our control. So once again, right, trying your best to be able to cope with these, the life stressors that get thrown at us right, left and center is a very, uh, is, is a proactive way to try to keep that immune system down at a nice normal level to, to reduce the risk of flare ups. Same with physical activity. So whether or not we are talking about inflammation-related arthritis or we're talking about osteoarthritis, it is important to listen to your body, all right? So I'm sure many of you have heard of the weekend warriors right? and people that say, well, I used to do it when I was 30. I should be able to do it now in my 60s. We may be expecting a little too much from our bodies at that point. And if your body says, ouch, or it hurts, right? That is a defensive mechanism for your body to say, just slow it down, right? I'm not liking something here. Now, I'm not talking about people going to chain yourself to a rocking chair and saying goodbye to all the things that give you joy in life that involve physical activity. But it does require, you know, you having a little bit of awareness as to what your body is okay with and what it is not. With inflammation-related arthritis, it depends on where you are in your journey of getting better. So, I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, is it, are, are you at the beginning stages of getting better? Where you still are symptomatic? We're still putting the medicine, we're still waiting for the medicines to kick in? You're going to have to be more gentle and kind with the expectations of your body. If you're in what we call remission, now, the expectations you can have of your body are different, and hopefully, you're pretty close to your baseline. For degenerative arthritis or osteoarthritis, don't be surprised if there is a change over time. And that change over time is that, oh, I used to be able to walk three kilometers, and over the past three years, I can now only do two kilometers without my groin hurting or maybe my knee hurting. Osteoarthritis is a condition that gets worse over time because it's degenerative. So it again is very important to distinguish what are those symptoms, right? And understanding is it the inflammation related arthritis? Is it the, the degenerative arthritis that is driving one's symptoms? Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts, Dr. Teo. I'm sure our attendees found that really valuable. Um, before we get into some live Q&A from the audience, and we have lots of good questions already, do you have any final thoughts or recommendations for our viewers? This is what I tell my patients. When me or my nurses are not around, you are your most important advocate. Meaning, right? we may not know exactly uh, um, as, as healthcare providers, oh, there it is again, and I, I do apologize. I was told to do my homework ahead of time, and obviously I didn't do it very well with turning off my, uh, my notifications, so apologies. When um, 
uh, we talk about MSK related conditions, whether it be inflammatory arthritis or whether it be degenerative, healthcare in general, we don't do a very good job in teaching our trainees and doctors. We don't. It's because it is something that is less what we call acute, right? It's something that is easily pushed off to the sides. And it's not common that inflammation related arthritis. I mean, you represent one or 2% of the population. The wear and tear arthritis is different, but there is not a lot of understanding and, uh, and not a lot of um, uh, awareness as to from the medical community at large as to how to manage your symptoms, especially the inflammation-related arthritis patients. So you need to be well-informed with A, what condition do you have? If you were to be in some type of crisis and needed to go to the hospital, would you be able to describe the diagnosis of your arthritis? Rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, that is key, that is very important. The second is to be able to uh, list or have in a safe place that you take with you a list of your medications. Right. That is very, very important because that helps others around you understand, especially healthcare providers, as to what is going on. And then the third, and I've alluded to it a few times, is to have that discussion with your healthcare provider as to what um, you should do if you do have a flare up. You need to have a backup plan. And as you know, doctors aren't available 24 seven, not the ones that may know your arthritis. So what is the plan that you and your healthcare provider have put in place to help manage your symptoms until you can get that appointment? So being your most important advocate when your healthcare provider is not around is key. That is great advice, Dr. Teo, and, and we certainly have heard that from patients and that has certainly inspired the Arthritis Society to produce a number of different tools and resources that will hopefully help patients to be their best advocates in those situations. So thank you for highlighting that. I think we will now go into the Q&A from this evening. And we have lots of good questions, some more general, some related to flares. I think you can help with all of them. I am going to start with a very timely question that I am sure you are hearing in your clinic all the time related to the COVID-19 vaccination. So a few questions here about, is there anything that we know about a link between vaccination and flares? And some people thinking about the booster shot, anything that we know there? Sure. This is a, this is a social experiment happening before our eyes. Doctors are not happy. All right, they're not happy because it's not happening the way that we normally study vaccines, right? And, and our conditions. So we are not confident in what we're doing, not as confident as we are with all the other vaccines that have ever been released with the approaches that we have previously taken. The best we can do is use our best guess, our experience to guide us into what we think is best for our patients. Now, when it comes to vaccines, vaccines in general, all right, it could be the COVID vaccine, it could be influenza vaccine, it could be the Shinrex vaccine. I like to use, uh, I bring it down a little bit more to just uh, a, a simpler approach to thinking about things. Remember how I told you that stress can cause flare ups, in particular of inflammation related arthritis. What does stress do? Stress raises your immune system up to run away from, you know, the saber-toothed tiger, right? Or to deal with the screaming child that's having a temper tantrum on the ground, whatever it is, right? Um, that, that is what stress is meant to do, but it, it's supposed to come back down. But in our patients, it doesn't, right? And that's what those flare-ups are about when they are triggered by stress. Vaccines do the exact same thing. Vaccines increase your immune system so that you can build immunity to whatever your virus or, or organism you're trying to protect yourself from. So have I seen my patients experience flares after receiving any of the vaccines? Absolutely, I have. I have. 
And I tell them that this is something that they should not be scared about. It is not representing anything bad about the vaccine or how they are likely responding to the vaccine. This is something, it is triggered a flare and we use our backup plan to get them through the flare. And then we hope that things will calm down. With osteoarthritis, it less likely to cause a flare, but again, right? Um, I wouldn't rule it out entirely, right? There, again, 8 billion people, 8 billion different bodies. So it is potentially possible, but that is the inflammation side of things. When it comes to the third dose for the COVID vaccine, we're learning, we're learning what to do. And this can be very um, provincially uh, directed. In British Columbia, where I am right now, only one group of rheumatology patients are being offered the third vaccine. It may be different uh, in your province where you're watching. Is it a good idea? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does uh, the medical community, including rheumatologists, no matter if you're treating osteoarthritis or inflammation related arthritis, are we recommending that our patients receive the third COVID vaccine? Yes, we are. Thank you very much for covering that. Um, there's a question here, a general question about do's and don'ts around a flare up, uh, in particular around physical activity. So is there any, are there any framing guidelines that you would give people around what to do when they're in a flare? Yeah, well, again, right? Uh, and this requires a little bit of self-reflection, right? And understanding you as an individual patient. Okay, so first and foremost, how are you going to emotionally or mentally respond to a flare, right? Because if there's a lot of anxiety and if there's lots of fear, you need to vocalize that you're going to need a lot of emotional support, right? To get through that, whoever those people are in your life. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, when you talk about flares, I mean, flares can happen in any one of the joints in the body, right? And again, as we talked about, it, it differs between inflammation-related arthritis and osteoarthritis. Um, but listening to your body is going to be key. So if it is your knee that is bothering you, well, well maybe I wouldn't do like, you know, the grouse grind, which is this thing that, you know, gives me palpitations and heart attacks, just thinking about it <laughs> in Vancouver, a very difficult climb up a mountain. I probably wouldn't do that. I'd probably listen to my body and rest it. If it was my hands that were flaring, maybe I wouldn't do, um, uh, play a, a, a piano concerto that day. L let your body recover from that acute state of inflammation, show it some kindness right? Allow it to recover and then reevaluate with your healthcare provider if you've gone back to your baseline. So once again, you must listen to your body. Okay. What about topical medications for flares? Could they possibly help? Mm, thank you. Thank you for reminding me about that, Sean, because you're right. I did neglect to mention the topical anti-inflammatories that could be used. So I'm sure many of you or most of you remember at the last uh, one of the uh, earlier slides, when we were talking about treatments for inflammation related or osteoarthritis, that anti-inflammatories could be used. Now, we also talked about how it is not appropriate for everyone, especially those that we worry about with the side effects of high blood pressure, kidney damage, or um, uh, uh, ulcers in the tummy. But the good news is, is that for more superficial joints, knee, for example, elbow, wrist, you can apply the same type of medicine as a cream or as an ointment. And the beauty of that is that you apply it to the place where you have the most symptoms rather than taking a pill where your whole body just sees a little bit. Now, it can be challenging for the big or, or the deep joints, right? Um, and if you've got lots of places that are flaring, I mean, well, I guess you could take a bath in it. Um, I don't know how comfortable that would be. And using your hands, I mean, gosh, this day and age, we're washing our hands all the time. So sometimes it's inconvenient, but it is an excellent option. Thank you very much for reminding me to remind the listeners that that is an option. Of course. Um, what about weather and climate and any linkage there between flares? Yeah, yeah, there, there's another one. And you've all heard it. I just like you've heard from uh, friends and family about diet. I know you've heard it about weather. And so have I. 
Uh, again, right? You take a hundred people with whatever arthritis and you change the weather. <laughs> Uh, and a hundred people that don't have arthritis, like we don't see a whole lot of difference, but once again, that's taking a generalized approach that doesn't apply to an individual. Are we beginning to think that maybe barometric pressure plays a role? Yeah, sure. And I mean, only, only because I see it day and day, um, in and day out, it has to affect some people. It sure does. All right. Does it need to affect everyone? No, it doesn't. I think the important thing, once again, for the listeners is to identify, is that a trigger for you? Is it possible? Absolutely. Uh, have we identified how it's possible and how many people with certain types of arthritis have it and why they have it? No, we, we haven't done that yet, but we're getting there. So we've done a few of these sessions related to medical cannabis and in particular CBD and potential around pain management. Mm. So the question, a couple questions here actually, do we know anything about the potential for CBD in the treatment of flares? Mm -hmm. Right. So CBD and then it's less uh, in fashion these days, but low dose naltrexone, right? These are complementary therapies that uh, patients look at. And once again, I don't blame you, right? You just want to contribute to your own personal well-being, right? And if the doctor can't do it or we're not, we're having a hard time finding it. I mean, we definitely need you to understand your body and to, uh, and what it responds to. Now, medicinal cannabis, that is yet another social experiment happening, not in the way that doctors had hoped for at the very beginning, right? It's an, it, it's just, playing out before our eyes and we're learning more from patient experience rather than the very rigid randomized controlled trials that we're more used to. The important thing to understand is this, all right, and I'm coming from BC, which, you know, quite frankly, is our national capital of <laughs> cannabis in general. I have had lots of patients try medicinal cannabis. What is the most important thing? All right, so A, understanding your relationship with your rheumatologist or your healthcare provider, right? Because I think it, in an ideal world, we would have that open dialogue, right? I think it is important for your healthcare provider to know that you are thinking about this or you're, you want to take it because although unlikely, sometimes there are reasons that we would be less than enthusiastic in regards to medication interactions, right? Or safety issues. Right. But for the most part, we just want to be aware and also learn from your experience. How did it go? CBD, very, very important. And for those of you who have seen all those other um, um, uh, webinars on it, I'm not going to reiterate and, and teach you all the stuff you already know. But CBD does not have the psychoactive component. And that's the one that we really hope for, right, for our patients to use when managing their uh, joint pain, their, their arthritis pain. I have lots of patients who have tried it. Some say it is effective. Some say it's not. And that's okay, right? Once again, it is taking that individualized approach to understand what does your body respond to. And quite frankly, if it means that you're on less of our medicines, I mean, I think that's a good, good place, right? But again, it is so important for your rheumatologist or your healthcare provider to know that is going on. But again, you have to gauge the comfort of, of having that type of discussion uh, yourself and, 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 and with your healthcare provider. So uh, again, no, 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 no um, specific yes or no, it helps or it doesn't trial it out, start low, go slow. We locally, and I'm sure you, uh, all the listeners as well, I would encourage you to identify um, uh, organizations, the, our businesses, whose goal is to help people use medicinal cannabis. Ideally, it involves a pharmacist on the team uh, and so perhaps a nurse or a physician where they can look and they can give you some guidance as to what would be a good way to take it. So for example, right, we would all say, let's, let's focus on the oils, right? We don't wanna be smoking it if possible because your lungs don't need that. And what is a start low, go slow? Where do you start? How do you increase it up? Having some support in that regard is a lot better than doing it by yourself. That's great advice. Um, I think this is a great question. When does a flare mean that your medications might have stopped working? Oh gosh. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Well, and that is why it is so important for your rheumatologist, uh, if we're talking specifically about uh, rheumat uh, RA as an example, right, or osteoarthritis, it is so important for your healthcare professional to know uh, about the flare-ups. Now, if we can assume, I'll, I'm going to use an, a rheumatoid arthritis example uh, for now. Say I see a patient every six months and uh, things have been great for two years. I haven't need to change medicines, no flare-ups. And all of a sudden they have a flare. And I see them six months later and they say, gosh, I had a flare two days after I saw you. It lasted for two minutes or well, okay, two days. Uh, I managed it well and everything was fine. I'd say, okay. Are you comfortable continuing on with the medicines, knowing that this was a one-off and likely not going to affect um, the long-term management, I feel, of your condition? And if this person says yes, I say, okay, one flare every two years, not a big deal. But if I haven't seen this patient for six months and they had a flare not only two days after I saw them, but then a flare six weeks after that and four, four weeks after that and two weeks after that, then absolutely, I want to bring that patient in to say, wow, something has changed with your immune system and we need to deal with that. And we need to look at some new treatment options. With osteoarthritis, again, less likely to have those big up and downs as we see in inflammation-related arthritis. But again, it's that decrease in function that you're going to notice. So, if you're used to walking three kilometers a day and you see your family doctor, I don't know, once a year, and now it is to less than half a block, you're waking up at night because your knee hurts, you're having difficulty getting off the toilet seat or out of a chair, I'm sure your healthcare provider would have wanted to know before things got that bad, right? And to see the, the progression, right, happening well before you hit that crisis point. So again, it depends on the frequency and the severity of the flare-ups. And for the osteoarthritis patients, how fast your functional decline is decreasing. Okay, so this is almost the opposite question. And the question is, how do I know when my reactive arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis has gone into remission? Oh, yeah. So uh, this is where we want to be. All right. As a rheumatologist, this is the best time of my day. I go in, I see a patient and, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing to report. There's been no flare ups and function. This is the magic word. Your function is back to where it was. That is our, I mean, universal definition of remission in my mind. Now, do we have fancy numbers and formulas in the world of rheumatology? Absolutely, we do. And that's how our scientific way of defining function. But numbers really, at the end of the day, don't really matter, right? How we know you're doing well is by you telling us that you are back to your normal life or you're pretty darn close to it. That's how you know you're in remission. But again, you got to remember for our patients with rheumatoid or reactive or ankylosing spondylitis, you were there because the medicines are working, right? And of course, there are opportunities to try to reduce the dose and see how far we could push it based on an individual's immune system. But it does not mean that things have gone away. It means the medicines are doing their job. So you mentioned a number of different types of arthritis. So a straightforward question here is Sjogren's an inflammatory arthritis? Yes. So Sjogren's, we like that Sjogren's, lupus are two examples, what we call connective tissue disorders. It means uh, your immune system sees the entire body. And uh, yes, there are patterns that we expect. Rheumatoid arthritis in particular, love certain joints, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. They're generally a little more predictable. For Sjogren's syndrome, for the patients out there listening, um, all of you, I'm sure, are going to have excessively dry eyes and dry mouth. Sometimes other parts of the body on the inside can also be inflamed. But yes, patients can also experience inflammation-related arthritis. A lot of the time, it can look like rheumatoid arthritis. But again, right, your immune system didn't read the textbook of rheumatology. 
right? So again, it requires you having that conversation with your healthcare provider. And in this, this instance, probably your rheumatologist to say what your arthritis, um, um, is, what symptoms your arthritis is causing you. And from there, we can tease out which one is it is. Great, I'm gonna ask you a couple more general questions, I think, as we're on this line. How, how would somebody know if they have osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis? Mm, okay. Now, again, these are generalized, uh, like very, very generalized approaches, right? They, uh, of course, nothing is black and white in medicine. Generally speaking, when you have wear and tear arthritis, we got to think about the whole process. What is wear and tear arthritis again? It is bone, you know, grinding on bone. And remember, you don't have that cartilage there, which, you know, protects you from feeling pain. So it is the nerve that's innervating the bone that makes you feel the pain, okay? So anything that is going to increase this is likely to cause the osteoarthritis pain, right? So the more you use a joint, the worse it gets. Right. I'm doing okay. I, I can walk a kilometer, but let me tell you, by a kilometer and a half, my knees, they're aching and I sit down and I feel better. Well, sure, you feel better when you sit down because you're taking away gravity and you're resting, right? And you're not doing this on those poor bones. Generally, rest makes those joints feel better. Right? Sometimes uh, some mild swelling can happen, but not generally. Now, with osteoarthritis, there is this condition which we call the gelling phenomenon, okay? So it's a little bit of stiffness. How many of you out there, you know, you're sitting, listening to this for an hour and you're gonna get up and oh, the first step or two, you just, you, you feel like the tin man, okay? That's what we call the gelling phenomenon. But once you do a few more steps, you're all loosened up and you feel good. These are typical symptoms of osteoarthritis. When it comes to inflammatory arthritis symptoms, it's a little different. The joints in, the, in, uh, in inflammation, like rheumatoid as an example, they seize up and they stiffen. And the less you use them, the harder it is to move them. I, have an, I saw a patient today and he said, if I don't exercise for three days, oh my God, my whole body just completely stiffens up. All right. Uh, so these people, when they wake up in the morning, they're very, they can, they're very stiff, very, very stiff. And it takes quite a while, sometimes a hot shower. Sometimes they need to take some anti-inflammatories, generally 30 minutes, an hour, several hours, sometimes all day. Patients are stiff and more commonly associated with swelling, right? As compared to the osteoarthritis and patients. Now, both patients can wake up with pain at nighttime. It depends on what joints involved. And again, that's why it's so important to um, explain this to your healthcare provider, but really um, basic, the more you use it, the more it hurts with uh, osteoarthritis, uh, the less you use it, the more it hurts with inflammation related arthritis. Okay, a question here about biologics. You've mentioned them a couple of times in some of your responses. So the main question is, are they safe and effective? And maybe you could touch on biosimilars as well in that context. Sure, sure. Biologics, they sound pretty fancy and, and they are incredible feats of biomedical engineering. They truly are. Uh, and I think for many young rheumatologists, including myself, they are the reason that we got into the profession because before them, over 40 or 50% of our patients had nothing. They had to live with pain and maybe be palliated with, you know, prednisone, which is a dirty drug or physiotherapy and braces and being wheelchairs. The reason we don't see all the deformities that if you Google rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis and the pictures that come up, we don't see those anymore because we understand A, that these are serious conditions that need to be treated aggressively, but two, because we now have so many more options. Now, biologics have given us a huge number of options for treatment. What is important to recognize is that they are what we call second line therapy. So for those of you who have inflammation related arthritis, I'm gonna be saying some names of medicines that are probably quite familiar. 
most of you had likely started on methotrexate, maybe some hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, lafunamide. These are what we call DMARDs. And I refer to them as the old medicines. Those have been around for decades, well, longer than that. Uh, and that's all we had before biologics. 60, 50 to 60% of our patients are gonna to respond to these medicines and have benefit. What are we gonna do with the other 40? Well, thank goodness, the other 40% of patients now have access to these new medicines, which we refer to as biologics. Technically, you know, we, we can also refer to them as advanced therapies, but that's just splitting hairs. Biologics, everyone knows what you're talking about. These medicines, why don't we use them first? Well, one, uh, they are quite costly. Uh, and depending on your drug plan and your province, right, there are certain uh, restrictions in place with what medicines can be used. Uh, and secondly, they do, they do come with some baggage, right? Compared to the old medicines, the advanced therapies or biologics are associated with a slight increased risk of infection, serious infection. And uh, how we like to describe it in my clinic is three to five people out of a hundred can experience a serious infection on biologics. Uh, most of the time it is a lung infection, but skin infection, urine infection, I mean, anything goes. So that is the main reason why they um, are taken a little more seriously and why we've done TB skin testing on patients because they can also wake up sleeping infections such as tuberculosis and also shingles. Two to four people out of a hundred can have shingles when on biologics. So when we talk about numbers like that, where you compare them to methotrexate, people say, well, why on earth would I wanna go on biologics then? I mean, if there's an increased risk of infection. That is why your rheumatologist has likely um, uh, 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 exhausted your old medicine options before the, the biologics are considered. And secondly, you have to, even though the numbers of three to five people out of 100 can sound very scary, if we flip it the other way, 95 to 97 people out of 100 are going to have a very good outcome on these medicines. Vast majority of people are going to use them without any problems. But once again, that word advocacy is very, very important. All my patients who go on biologics, every time they come and do have an appointment with me, and I know they just love it, they do a quiz. They do a four question multiple choice quiz on how to safely use their biologic, of course, if they're on one. And it's a helpful reminder of how you can advocate for yourself when we are not around. So if you have an active infection, that's probably not an appropriate time to continue with a medicine that brings your immune system back down to a normal level, right? Um, uh, the same with the shingles, uh, talking about how to protect yourself from getting shingles reactivation is important uh, preventative way to, uh, to, to experience that complication. Okay, we just have a couple minutes, but I wanna ask you one important question that may not have a straightforward answer, but that is for people who are experiencing some of these symptoms that you've talked about tonight. Uh, what would somebody do if they don't have a family doctor available to them or a care team around them? What advice would you give people in that situation? Yeah, and is, isn't this the problem? I mean, in my area, right, uh, family physicians are so hard to find uh, and it exists all across our amazing country. Once again, advocating for yourself is so important in this scenario more than anything else. And you have to do more of the work, right, than someone who has uh, um, a patient care home. So understanding the difference between inflammation-related arthritis and osteoarthritis can be helpful because I've, I've already told you that when you go see that walk-in clinic doctor or maybe even that emergency room doctor that's thinking about let's fix some life-threatening condition, because they don't really have a whole lot of experience in dealing with arthritis, they may not really know what to do. And they're your access point. They are the people that are gonna get you the care that you need. Sometimes they need a little bit of help, right? And a little bit of guidance and how you can advocate for yourself is A, be able to articulate your symptoms. 
What exactly are those symptoms you're having? What joints are involved? When are they involved? How is it affecting your function? That's huge. And what have you tried to help with those symptoms? That is an excellent place, first place to start. And it kind of eases that person who you're seeing in acute care or a walk-in clinic to help remind them of those important questions to ask, or at least those important parts of the history to, uh, to look at. I would, I would strongly recommend that that would be the first way to go. Thank you so much for all of your thoughts today, Dr. Teo. Very, very helpful. We'd like to take just a few moments to get the audience's feedback on today's presentation. So for those of you who are on a laptop or desktop, you will see a poll question come up on your screen. And so please click the response that reflects your thoughts. Very simply, did you find the information in today's webinar helpful to you? We will be sending out an evaluation form when we send out the recording. So if you are unable to access the poll questions, you will have the opportunity to offer feedback at that time. And we really do use this feedback to help shape our Arthritis Talks webinar. So we really value your input. Once again, we are grateful to our sponsors, Pfizer, Novartis, and United Way Winnipeg for their support of this event. As many of you know, September is Arthritis Awareness Month, and as we close off the month, we invite you to help us raise $1 million this month to support people affected by arthritis. To make a donation today, please visit arthritis.ca slash fight the fire that Dr. Teo talked so much about. Also in the coming weeks, we have more opportunities to get involved. On October 6th, we'll be hosting Rock the Joint, a virtual battle of the bands, which is poised to be an incredible evening, showcasing talented amateur music musicians from all across Canada. We will also be back later in October for Arthritis Talks, Get Active and Stay Active, featuring physiotherapist Trevor Donald from Saskatchewan. This concludes Arthritis Talks, Managing Flares. On behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us today. Stay well.